as the summer kicks off for many of us, I'm going to take you on a tour of the nighttime sky for the month of July. We're going to do this by breaking things down into four different categories, beginning with meteor showers, the moon, the planets of our solar system, and deep sky objects. Regardless of your experience level or the equipment that you currently own, there are going to be things listed in this video that you'll be able to get out and see and enjoy. If you find this video helpful, please like it and join our growing community of amateur astronomers by subscribing to this channel. But most importantly, let me know what you plan to get out and see, observe, and image in the comment section below. Now let's begin today by talking about one of the most relaxing and easiest things you can do in amateur astronomy by going outside and enjoying a meteor shower. Meteor showers are a wonderful way to get into amateur astronomy if you're new to the hobby because they require absolutely no equipment to go out and enjoy. July has two meteor showers at the end of the month, the Delta Aquarids and Alpha Capricornids meteor showers. To see them, go out on the night of July 28th into the early morning of July 29th and face towards the east. Look for Jupiter, and from there, you'll find the constellation Aquarius that this meteor shower appears to emanate from. For those of you in the southern hemisphere, expect a rate of meteors around 15 to 20 per hour. And for those of us in the northern hemisphere, a more modest 5 to 10 meteors can be expected. But the nearby moon will do a lot to hurt those numbers this July. Also emanating from this part of the sky and peaking at the same time is the Alpha Capricornids meteor shower. This is a very weak show with only about 5 meteors per hour, but if you're already out looking for the Delta Aquarids, you might as well see if you can trace any coming out of the Capricornus constellation. Remember, whenever you're out to see a meteor shower, you're going to want to do a few things. Number one, like I said earlier, don't use any equipment at all. Get in a comfortable position and look up at the widest part of the sky that you can. Second, Try to get to as dark of a sky as possible for where you live to really maximize the faint meteors for any night. And number three, give yourself plenty of time to enjoy this event. Patience is a virtue when it comes to astronomy, and that's particularly true for meteor showers, when sometimes it can be 5, 10, 15, or 25 minutes between meteors, especially for weaker shows like we have in the month of July this year. As we move away from the atmosphere of Earth, which helps to create the meteor showers we just talked about, let's move on to our closest neighbor, the Moon. This is another excellent target for those of you who are new to amateur astronomy because all you need is the naked eye, a pair of binoculars, or a small telescope to really start to see and experience and enjoy the features of the lunar surface. July 10th will see a new moon phase with virtually no part of the moon illuminated as it rises and sets with the sun on this day. July 17th finds the moon at the first quarter phase, where roughly half of it will be illuminated from our perspective. We'll then go to the last week of July where we find a full moon on the 24th. The waxing crescent phases between new moon and first quarter moon are always my favorite times to get out and observe and image the lunar surface. It's during these times that the sun's light comes in at an angle and the surface really comes to life with shadows and craters that are very nice to see. For those of you interested in taking images of the moon, I found the best way to do it is by simply connecting my cell phone to my telescope and then taking pictures and videos that can be quickly shared with friends and family or later put into post-processing software for stacking and further enhancements. Now let's move away from Earth and talk about the best views of the other planets in our solar system for the month of July. For those of you that are early risers, try to get out and see the planet Mercury as it just peaks above the horizon right before sunrise. But as you can see, its quick orbit around the sun takes it back down below the horizon by the end of the month. Switching from the early morning to early evening sky, Venus dominates the western sky right after sunset. One thing I'm working on right now is an astronomical league program that has me track the phases of Venus throughout several months of the year. 
This is something you can do with a pair of binoculars or a small telescope. And if you're interested in it, I'll be sure to leave a link to this program in the description below. Our next planet, Mars, is really tough to see right now as it continues to move away from us and fall lower to the horizon after sunset. But if you go out on July 13th and look for Venus, you'll find Mars paired right with it in the sky. Through my telescope at 48 times magnification, both of these planets will appear in the same field of view, which is a pretty incredible thing to see through an eyepiece. As we move from the inner planets of our solar system to the outer gas giants, we come across my two favorite planets to view and image, which are paired together in the nighttime sky for the rest of this year, Jupiter and Saturn. With Jupiter, you have basically a mini solar system that you can study on a nightly basis with the Galilean moons orbiting around it. And with Saturn, what more needs to be said of this beautiful planet and its famous rings? Both Jupiter and Saturn start off July low to the horizon in the southeast sky before midnight, but slowly begin to make their way higher and higher each night until reaching a more comfortable observing height by the end of the month. Some dates of interest are July 24th and July 25th, when the Moon will make a close approach to each of these two planets. Even though these targets will be much better views and easier to see as we get into August and September, I still plan on staying up late into the night and early into the morning throughout the month of July to try to image and view them through my own telescope. As we finish out our tour of the solar system this month, let's take a look at two planets that are difficult but rewarding views, Uranus and Neptune. Uranus is going to honestly be a tough one this month, just barely poking itself above the horizon around 3 a.m. at the start of the month and slowly making its way higher as the month goes on. Neptune, however, follows right behind Jupiter and Saturn but will still be low to the horizon for most of the month making such a dim target really difficult to view for most of us. If you're new to astronomy, go out and simply try to find the planet Venus right after sunset throughout the month of July. For those of you with binoculars or a small telescope, see if you can even make out some of the phases of this planet as it slowly begins to change in the months to come. For Jupiter and Saturn, a pair of binoculars will show off the Galilean moons of Jupiter, and a small telescope will reveal the beautiful rings of Saturn. Regardless of your experience and equipment, be sure to let me know in the comments section below what you're able to get out and image and observe of our planets this month. As we move beyond our solar system and into the deep parts of space in our galaxy, and even beyond, it's important to know that as we get into this part of the video, we're going to be talking about some objects that can be more difficult to find, especially if you have limited experience in amateur astronomy. We're going to have visuals to help you find these objects, and I've also tried to include things on this list that are visible in some cases through a pair of binoculars or a small telescope. But for these objects, the larger the telescope and the darker the skies, the better experience you're going to have. Let's begin with one of the crown jewels of the summer sky, M13, the Great Hercules Constellation. If you go out around 11 p.m. and look nearly straight up, you'll find the constellation Hercules and this impressive globular cluster with its hundreds of thousands of stars. Start at low magnifications for almost all of these deep sky objects, but for something like the Hercules cluster, Test out your telescope's magnification limit by slowly increasing the magnification up to 100, 200, maybe even 300 times magnification, just to see how much you can get out of this star field while still getting a sharp image. Let's move from the Hercules constellation over to Lyra, which is one of my favorite regions of space this time of year. Begin by enjoying the views of one of the brightest stars in the sky, Vega. Its beautiful blue tone will pop right out of the background of space. From there, move down to the double-double binary star system. What appears as one star to the naked eye under most conditions will split into two stars with binoculars and four stars at high magnification if your telescope can handle it. 
This is a fun one to show off the capabilities of your telescope to friends and family, and also to explain to people how so many stars in the nighttime sky are actually binary star systems, even if they may appear as one star to the naked eye. Next, a visit to this part of space would be incomplete without going to one of the most unique objects in the night sky, the Ring Nebula. This is going to take high magnifications for good views, and not every telescope can resolve it that well. But in my 8-inch Dobsonian telescope, I can pump it up to 200 times magnification for some remarkable views of this faint, circular deep sky object. Finally, for our tour of deep sky objects this July, let's move down to the Dumbbell Nebula and the Veil Nebula. Of these two, the Dumbbell is the easier to observe, even showing up nicely in a pair of binoculars and small telescopes. The Veil Nebula is a more difficult target, but for those of you with larger telescopes and darker skies free of light pollution, these faint nebulas cutting through the sky are a sight to see. Try using a light pollution filter when observing this object. I found good success with an O3 filter in particular on this target when observing it visually. That's just some of the most impressive things that you're going to be able to get out and see this July under the nighttime sky. Whatever you're able to get out and see or image, please be sure to let me know about your experience in the comment section below. Thank you all so much for your continued support and clear skies from Late Night Astronomy.